Okay. So, um, so what? So just a review of what we did last week. So last week we covered um, last week we covered permutations, which were arrangements of things when order matters, right? It's when order matters. Um, we also had combinations, which were choosing things where the order didn't matter, right? So the example I gave, the analogy that I gave was that permutations, right? I was, I was thinking about maybe like, maybe like runners in a race, right? It, it matters in which order that they place in, right? Um, combinations, it's more of like, maybe like different denominations of currency, right? So we have like, maybe like uh, a dime, a nickel, a penny, whatever. It doesn't matter in which order that you pay them. It just matters that you pay all of them. You pay the uh, 16 cents, I think. But we have different situations that can be modeled by permutations or combinations or some some mixture of the two, right? Some In every problem, there are some elements of that problem where the order of the elements sort of matters it's counted differently and there might be other parts of the problem where you're only looking for combinations of different things where the order of the elements does not really matter so we also talked about um factorials right factorials which were products of the integers from products of integers from one to n right the product of one times two times three times four, blah, 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 all the way to n. That's that's what we define as n factorial, right? And this um, this factorial sort of thing shows up very frequently in permutation problems. So, like, if if you if you're trying to find out like how how many ways can a group of some number of distinct people arrange themselves right then you would use a factorial to describe the number of ways that they could arrange themselves um so we also covered combination notation which will be useful later on today which is the number of ways to choose uh a group in of k elements out of n total elements right and the key thing is that the group is unordered so the order of the elements within the group doesn't matter all that matters is whether each element gets selected in to be in the group or not in the group so that's combination notation where the you're choosing a group out of n elements and the order of the elements in the group does not matter. So it turns out that the number of ways that we can choose um choose k unordered elements out of n total elements turns out to be n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. Okay? So this 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 n factorial n choose k is equal to n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial and we also have some elementary properties that i told you about which is like n choose k is equal to n choose n minus k this is decently obvious um and did i tell you anything else um I'll leave, I'll leave the rest to discuss today. So, so what what you should be familiar with uh, going into this is the combination notation. If you're not familiar with combination notation, then 
I suggest that you check out maybe last week's lecture um, or maybe um, the handout for week two, which probably explains it better than I do, depending on how you like to learn. But anyways, Okay, so on to the main topic, which is Pascal's triangle. Okay, so today I'll be focusing on this idea known as Pascal's triangle. It was named after some mathematician. I'm not going to get into that. Um, so it's a triangle of numbers. It's a triangle of numbers. And so, so it goes like, it, it, it is made up of what we call rows. Now I'm sure you, I'm sure most people have seen this before. So the first row of Pascal's triangle is just one. So the one is the first row. The second row is one and one. A second row and the third row one and one go at the ends and in the middle we take the sum of the two elements above it so one plus one equals two so in general general isn't it called the zero row sometimes not? Um, uh, uh, I'm not really sure. I think that might make sense, but I'm, I, I'm not going off of any, any source. It's just what I remember. But in, in, you, might, you, could, you could connect it as zero row, one, first row second row probably might make more sense if as we go on in general each cell is the sum of the two numbers right above it right so with the exception of one uh, the one at the top each cell is going to be the sum of the two numbers that are above it. And one, if one of the numbers is empty, if one of the numbers is empty, we count it as zero, right? So we can continue this rule. So the next number in the, in the, in the okay, the third, third row is going to be the one on the very left, the far left, because we're summing the number one with empty, I guess empty. Um, then we have one and two, that makes three. Two and one, that makes three. One and nothing, that makes one. So now we have one, three, three, one. Now I'll keep going. Um, you have one. Four, six, four, one. Then we have one, five, ten, ten, five, one. And you keep going in this way. We create more and more rows in this way. So technically, we can keep generating new rows using this rule, right? Each number is the sum of the two above it. We can continue this construction indefinitely. We, we can continue this indefinitely. So it turns out that uh, Pascal's triangle is actually not really a triangle in the sense that it's it actually goes on inf infinitely long. Pascal's triangle, Pascal's triangle is infinitely large, right? Because you can just keep going, 
keep going down, keep creating new rows. Um, you can go to any, any, so there's any possible number of rows. You, you just keep going down, 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 down. It keeps going on indefinitely. So you can, gener you can generate arbitrarily large rows, if that makes any sense. So there's, there's no end. There's no end to Pascal's triangle. So this is ba the basic de definition. This is how we basically define it. And if you, so, um, so if you just if you just take it at face value, right? You just have this weird triangle of integers, and there doesn't. You, know, you might say this is just constructed so randomly. We're just we're just taking this arbitrary rule, and we're just making this weird triangle of numbers, how can it possibly be useful? But it turns out that this, this, this weird triangle of numbers turns out to be very useful in combinatorics. Um, it had, uh, as we'll see as we keep going along this lesson, but there's really lots of properties. It's like, it's sort of like a, it's like a gold mine of sorts because there's just so many things that you can notice about the Fibonacci, about the, Pascal's triangle. Um, I can't really cover it all in one in ninety minutes, but I'll just give you the the main the main points. I'll, I'll discuss the main points of Pascal's triangle to you. So, okay. So the first. So the first first we'll we'll analyze like some basic properties. So so first of all the First property is um, Pascal's triangle is symmetric, right? It's symmetric along along this line. So this line, right? You can sort of. It's sort of. I didn't. I didn't draw it very well, but it's symmetric along the middle. So if you sort of. I guess if you imagine mirroring Pascal's triangle along the middle, then it sort of maps back onto itself. So the number here, right, it's always going to be the same as the number over here. The number here is the same as the number here. Here is the same as the number over here. So the Pascal's triangle, it's symmetric along the middle. And this, I think, I think, it, I think this is pretty obvious. It's, it's not very hard to see why this is true it just follows from the definition of the triangle we established earlier so the second property is that we have these 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 diagonals we have these diagonals and and once we take these diagonals right these diagonals of numbers let's say like we we, we see some interesting patterns pop out so the right most or the word of leftmost depending on i'm just assuming rightmost but leftmost is the same thing right there's the same thing going on because of the reflect of, because of the symmetry along the middle sorry but sorry okay so so the rightmost diagonal it's made up made up of only ones right it's one and there's one here then there's one there there's one there there's one there there's one there, one there, one there, one there and so on right the next diagonal from the right from the right we have our we have our counting numbers we have we have one we have one so my pencil is not working two Well, this is bad. Uh, hold on. Huh. Sorry for that. Um, 
Okay, so the next diagonal from the right, it's our counting. It's our counting numbers. Um, and so that, that goes one, two, three, four, five, six, off, and so on. The next diagonal is turns out to be the triangular numbers. So the triangle, the triangular numbers are defined as one, one plus two, one plus two plus three, one plus two plus three plus four, and so on. Um, the next, so you can think of them as the number of, of, I guess, circles in each of these triangles, right? If you arrange these circles into a triangle of this sort, like I said, one, one plus two, one plus two plus three, one plus two plus three plus four, and so on. I think you get what I'm saying. So we have these triangular numbers, which are the sum of the first n integers, right? The first n counting numbers. So these appear on the next row from the from the right. Then we also have the we also have the tetrahedral numbers, which are the fourth from the right. This is where we were arranging spheres into a tetrahedron. So in these we so the n tetrahedral number is the sum of first n triangular numbers. So these these are these are actually pretty often neglected. Um, they show up more often than one might think, but the way these work is that we have let's say one right one plus one plus two that's our second and we have one plus one plus two plus one plus two plus three equals um 10 and so on right so these are the tetrahedral numbers and so any any you can keep going but usually um I, 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 I just stop at the tetrahedral numbers. Um, so basically, yeah, so you have these properties of these diag these sort of diagonals of Pascal's triangle that form sort well basically well known integer se sequences, right? So you have the constant the constant one repeated again and again. You have the positive integers in increasing order. You have the the triangular numbers increasing order you have the tetrahedral numbers in increasing order and and you, you can say the same thing for these diagonals as well right so there is just looking at these diagonals alone there's a lot going on in Pascal's triangle but um okay so next thing uh I like to talk about is um the connection between Pascal's triangle and the the combination notation that I've talked you talked you through before, right? So th this is basically to me at least this is what at the heart of what Pascal's triangle really is, and how I think about Pascal's triangle is not like a triangle of numbers with these this weird recursive definition, right? I th I think of Pascal's triangle as a list of different combination numbers, right? So you have maybe like n choose k appearing in whatever row and whatever diagonal, right? So I think it, so to, the way we go about this is through um, path finding, right? So how many, how many different paths take you from some point to some other point? Using only that, but um, using only left arrows and right arrows, right? 
using only left arrows and right arrows, how many paths are there to get from some point and to some other point. So in, in this case, the so this is just a way to think about the problem. So how many, so let's say we have, this is our initial starting position. This is, this is initial starting position start. And let's say this is our end, right? So using only left down arrows and right down arrows, how many ways can we get from our start position to our end position, right? So you have, so if you, if you take in last week's class, right, you would know that the answer would be free choose one. Um, we have, there, there must be two down left arrows and there must be one down right arrow. So we just, we're just arranging these three. So our answer actually turns out to just be three choose one, which is, which is equal to three. Okay. So our three paths in this case turn, turn out to be the one I've just drawn. We also, we can also go right, left, left, or we can go left, left, right, right? Um, so these are our three ways to get from the start to the end. So actually, if we look, so as this, right, this actually corresponds with the three in this, in this row in Pascal's triangle, right? They sort of, we, we sort of have the numbers sort of lining up because we have three ways to get from the start position to this point, but this point, right, in Pascal's triangle, this position actually corresponds with a three. So, so you might you might be thinking now that, but that there's some relation between Pascal's triangle and these combination numbers, right? These and and n choose k equals n factorial over k factorial choose n minus k factorial, right? There, so and it turns out that you would be right because there is a relationship between Pascal's triangle and these combination numbers for, for lack of a better word. Um, so to see, so to see this, we need some, so to see why these, these sort of line up, Right, these sort of line up with the combination numbers. Um, we need to think about how Pascal's triangle is defined. So, so, so once again, so we, we think about Pascal's triangle. How how is it, how is it defined? Right. So the first so the first number is one. So that's so this is number, you can think of this as the number of ways from the starting, to go from the starting point to itself. There's just one way to stay in place. So once again, we mark this as the start. Um, for each of these, we, these, these are also number, of ways to get from starting point to each of these positions, right? Now we look at, um, we, it's kind of hard to see that one and one, these also, also match up. Let's look at, let's look at this number, okay? So how many ways are there to get from the start position to the number in this circle over here. So the first way, so there, so to do this, we think of it as two cases, right? So first, the first case is that the, as we go from, as we take our path, we go to this, 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 this point, 
and then go here. So that's one, that's one possibility. The other case is that we end up at this point before we get to our final destination. So that's also, that also in this case, that also yields one. So now we have two. Um, let's, keep, let's keep going with this. So how, how many ways are together to get to this point? So we, so there's one way to get to this point and then we can jump off to this point, up off to our final destination. And there's two ways to end up at this point, at which point we can also jump off at our final destination. So the number in this row, right, um, it ends up being three. It's just one plus two. That's the number of ways to get from our start to our end position. So this is another way to think about pathfinding, right? Instead of thinking about our combination notation argument for pathfinding, we define how many ways are there to get from our initial starting position to our end position. We think of it sort of recursively, right? We think about the two places that we could have been before we went to our final destination. So we think about case one, we end up at this point, then jump to our final destination. And then, or we could end up at that point first and then jump to our Found destination in that way. Okay, so so we you can sort of see here that we're, we're sort of building we're building this recursive definition for definition for path walking, right? So we have one, two, one plus two is three. Um, let's keep going, right? So let's say we have maybe let's maybe I'll make, maybe I should do build a couple more rows in this way. Let's look at one more example. So let's say we want to find how many ways are there to get from our start position to our end position. End position. So we have two cases, right? Before we get to the end position, we could either end up at five and jump off. There's five possibilities for this case, five ways to get to five, and then we jump to the end. Or there's 10 ways to get to this point, and then we jump to the end. So once again, so we have five plus 10, right? And we also can't have a point going. And this is this actually follows from the fact that we can only through each path, right, it passes through exactly one of these two points. It cannot pass through both and it cannot pass through neither. And this follows from the fact that there's only left down steps and right down steps, right? So we must pass through, must pass through exactly one of these two points over here. So we have five and we have 10. So we add these together, right? We get 15 and you know, so we know that that's right. So this is, we find a recursive definition for path walking. And the reason why Pascal's triangle is so useful is that this basically corresponds precisely with our initial definition of Pascal's triangle. So, so what we actually find is that we can match numbers in Pascal's triangle with these numbers that we get from trying to find the number of paths between the start and some end position, right? So we can match numbers in Pascal's triangle to come by notorial numbers. Okay. So before I show how we match numbers in Pascal's triangle to come by notorial numbers, I would, so I'll, I'll give you another way to 
to think about this recursive definition for pathfinding that that this is something called Pascal's identity, which is which shows up quite a lot in quite a lot in combinatorics. We have we we have this this identity, right? So we have n choose k plus n choose k plus one equals n plus one choose k plus one, right? So the first way, so this you might notice that this is actually this is actually sounds a little bit like the the recursive definition we had for pathwalking, right? The so number of ways to get to here is the number of ways to get to here plus the number of ways to get to here. Um, and this is they're both 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 basically saying the same thing, just just in different notations. So first, let's prove this algebraically, right? So I haven't shown you the algebraic proof, but it's decently simple. So we have n choose k, we, have, we express it in terms of factorials. We have something like this. Okay, so now, now what we want to do is we want to, let's, let's factor out the common, common terms we have. N factorial over factorial minus k plus one factorial, then this times this time, right? Uh, this times n factorial times right so. Mm. So this this times um one over n minus k plus one over k plus one if I'm right. Yes. Um so this if you do the algebra I'll I'll leave it to you to do this. Uh but if you do the algebra, this actually comes out to be. We just have, you just have to combine these two fractions. You'll get you'll get uh, n plus one factorial in the numerator. You'll get k plus one factorial in the denominator, and you'll get n minus k factorial in the in the denominator as well. So this corresponds exactly with n plus one choose k plus one so this is pascal's identity another so the way, way i want to the way i want to think about pascal's identity is let's say let's say we want to choose k plus one elements from a total of n plus one a total of n plus one right so we consider we single out we single out one element p okay so if p is in the k plus one elements there are n choose k ways to choose the rest because there's k more elements to choose and there's n more elements to choose it from so that's the case one if p is not in the k plus one elements we actually have n choose k plus one ways to choose the rest because we have k plus one elements left to choose because p is not in does the set now and we have n total elements that we have to choose it from so we basically sum these two n choose k plus n choose k plus one and we're counting the exact same thing as n plus one choose k plus one right so we're counting one thing using two different ways we count it using the easy way and we do like some random we do this casework argument 
where we get this, this result. So now we know that the two results must be equal. So this is known as a, this is what we call a bijection, right? One, two different ways of counting one single thing. In this case, these two separate ways must yield the same result. So, so, so I've given you an algebraic proof for Pascal's identity, and we also have this much neater um, combinatorial proof. So, if we notice that if we put, let's say, n choose k here and n choose k plus one here, and then 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 they, they're going to add to n plus one choose k plus one. So if you arrange these numbers in this way, then it actually looks a lot like the recursive structure of Pascal's triangle, doesn't it? So to see this, um, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, so I'm just gonna draw, I wanna construct Pascal's triangle one more time. Um, one right so this actually corresponds with some count these correspond with combinatorial numbers and that, that actually means um zero to zero one corresponds with zero to zero this one and then we have one choose zero and one choose one on the next row and we have two choose zero two choose one two choose two on the next row we have um, we have three choose zero, three choose one, three choose two, three choose three on the next row. I can keep going on this way. So we have four choose zero, four choose one, four choose two, four choose one, no, four choose three, four choose four, and we can keep going on in this way, right? So if you compute each of these, right, so 4 choose 2 equals 6, 3 choose 2 equals 3. If you could, if you compute these, we, we, by arranging them, by arranging our combinatorial, from arranging our combination numbers in this way, we get the exact same arrangement of numbers that is in Pascal's triangle, right? We get we get the exact same arrangements of numbers that, that is in Pascal's triangle. And the reason why we have this is because of that that's that Pascal's identity, right? So we we will get three choose one plus three choose two equals four choose two. We will get two choose zero plus two choose one equals three choose one, and so on. So we can keep we we can keep building our rows of combinatorial no, com, com, combination numbers in this way, in the same way that we construct Pascal's triangle. So basically, we have this course, sort of correspondence between numbers in Pascal's triangle and uh, combination numbers that I've talked about last week. So, okay, so, so now that we have this, this sort of new definition of Pascal's triangle, it's just another way of arranging our combinatorial, our combinatorial numbers, um, we can investigate some, some, some other identity. So this is this is one neat property of the of combination number that you should be familiar with, and it, it goes like this. So, so what is the sum n choose zero plus n choose one plus n choose two plus n choose three plus blah blah, blah all the way up to n choose n, right? So what what number does this sum evaluate to? Uh, so, so the um, so it turns out magically, to me magically, 
this comes out to be 2 to the power of m. So, so how do we prove that this ends up being 2 to the power of m? So the one way we, we can think of this is but one way that I like, my personal favorite way to choose, think about this is choosing subsets of the numbers one through n, right? Choosing, choosing subsets. How many unordered subsets of the numbers from one to n are there? So there's two n subsets in total. Obviously, each element is in or not in the subset, right? And the other way we can we can find a number of ways to choose subsets is casework on how many numbers are in our subset. Casework on how many numbers are in our subset. So if there are zero numbers in our subset, then there's n choose zero ways to find the number of subsets. And if our subset has one element, then there's n choose one subsets. If there's two elements, then there's n choose two subsets, and so on. And if n choose n, right, it corresponds with the set with all elements in it, all n elements in it. So, so if we sum, so the casework on how many numbers in the subset, that yields this 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 value over here right so that's one way of counting the number of subsets of n elements the other way which is much easier is just choosing um, whether each element is in or not in the subset so that comes out to be two to the power of n so magically since we're counting the same thing two different ways we end up with the same thing on both sides so we have that the left side, which is the sum of the combination numbers, where the top number is n, the sum of all of these actually turns out to be exactly 2n. So this gives us another this gives us another property of Pascal's triangle. So rows of Pascal's triangle sum to powers of two. For example, if the zero row sums to two to the power of zero, the first row sums to two to the power of one, then we have two two to the power of two in this row, two to the power of three, two to the power of four, two to the power of five, two to the power of six. And it turns out it turns out you can also prove this using the recursive definition of of Pascal's triangle. So you can actually prove this using the recursive definition of Pascal's triangle. So you can think of, and the reason why you can prove that the rows of Pascal's triangle sum to powers of two in this way is that you just have to prove, right, by induction, you just have to prove that each row is two times the sum of the row before it. Each row is two times the sum of the one before it. So the, re the way you can think about it is, let's say, um, there, you can think of each row as the sum of numbers from the previous row, right? So each number from the previous row is counted exactly two times, sort of. It's sum, it appears in the sum exactly two times, right? So for, and this, and this keeps going on. So each number, right, it contributes itself to two different numbers, if that makes any sense. And you can keep going on in this way. So using the recursive definition of Pascal's triangle, we actually have another way to prove that the sums of rows of Pascal's triangle, right? They sum the powers of two. So, so and this, this stems from the fact that we can, we can 
we can express sums of sums of the rows of Pascal's triangle in terms of uh, we can express them in terms of the numbers in rows that have appeared previously before. Okay, so so case work on how many so. I've given you so now now we have two proofs of this this neat property it's pretty important and and we also have another neat property of Pascal's triangle that we have discovered okay so next next thing is the the hockey stick identity this is also a decently important identity so this is um r so Let's so for two positive integers r and n such that r is less than n, well less than or equal to n, I guess. You have that r choose r plus r plus one choose r plus r plus two choose r plus blah 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 and so on plus n choose r equals and this all comes out to n plus one choose r plus one. Okay. So we have this sum of these terms, and they all end up to be n plus one choose r plus one. Okay. So, for example, right, we have we have this. So, so the reason why we call this the hockey stick identity, right, is when we list the the numbers on the left hand side. And then we have the number in the right hand side. They sort of form like a hockey stick shape, right? So this would be like the, the this, this is would be like the, the long stick thing, I don't know. And this would be like the thing that you swing. So the numbers in this in this pink section, right? I'll leave this to you to verify, they actually sum to the number in in the, the blue section, right? They sum to the number in the blue section. 1 plus 4 plus 10 plus 20 plus 35 equals 70. So this actually turns out to be um, 3 choose 3, 4 choose 3, plus 5 choose 3, plus 6 choose 3, plus 7 choose 3. When you sum these five numbers together, we get 8 choose 4. Also our final answer, which is 70. So the hockey stick identity, the sum, is... It follows from Pascal's identity, but I won't have t enough time to cover the, the full proof. So I guess that will be something that I'll leave to you to, to verify. So this is the hockey stick identity. Um, okay, so this is something that is very important. Binomial expansion, right? So a lot of times in math, we, we want to find, we have like two, two, two terms right we'll call them x and y you have two terms x and y and we are raising them to the power of n for some n so we want to so we, we will, once we expand this once we expand this come and we combine like terms we have a lot of different terms with x and y so let's say we have just we have we could have x just x plus y we can have x plus y squared that becomes x squared plus 2xy plus y squared most people notice we also have x cubed plus 3xy 3x squared y plus 3xy squared plus y squared we then and then x plus y to the power of four we get x to the power of four plus four x cubed y plus six x squared y squared plus four y x y cubed plus y to the power of four and you can keep going this keep going like this and keep generating coefficients for x plus y to raise to the power of n for some n. So, so first of all, the degree of all these terms, the degree is always n. So what I mean by the degree 
is sum of x's exponent and y's exponent. I want to find the sum of x's exponent and y's exponent. So the degree is always n when we expand x to the y to the power of n. And we basically have these coefficients of these terms, right? So we have two, we have one at the end, maybe three, four, six. We saw see all these, and they, they actually seem, if we list them out, they actually seem a little bit like the rows of, oh, sorry. They seem a little bit like the rows of Pascal's triangle and um, writing on top of myself here but so it seems like when we're expanding these binomials right there's something related to there's something related to the combination numbers when we expand x plus y to the power of n so the general question is for some term x to the power of k times y to the power of n minus k what's the coefficient of this term what's the coefficient of this term and the answer actually turns out to be n choose k okay so the coefficient of x to the power of k times y to the power of n minus k turns out to be n choose k so why why is it why is this true why does why is why are these combination numbers showing up in our algebra right so the reason why we have this property is because we can think of the coefficient as the number of ways to choose k, k terms out of n total terms okay so so for so when we when we expand x plus y to the power of n we create a bunch of terms we create actually two to the power of n terms before we combine them until we combine like terms together so each of these two to the power of n possible outcomes right each of them corresponds with a different way to choose some number of x plus so so each term right each term has some number of x's that are contributed to it so like let's say x plus y you look at the n plus 3 equals 3 case right x plus y plus x plus y plus x plus y there's there, each term right so let's say x x squared plus y we had to have had two terms that sort of contributed an x to it and then we have uh, another term that contributed a y to it right this way when we multiply them together using the distributive property, right? It would come out to be two x's in the multiplication, the two x's in the product, and then we have uh, another y in the product. I'm, I'm not sure if that makes sense. But each term has some number of x's that are contributed to it. And then, so the number of ways that we can choose the number of x's that are contributed, it, it turns out to be n choose k so n is the total number of terms in the product and k is the number of x's that are in the product right so we're basically choosing k out of the n terms to choose to contribute an x and i think i'm pre being pretty hand wavy about this but this essentially follows from the distributive property and, the, and the, i'll leave it to you to verify this on your own so once again so for any x to the power of k no 
times y to the power of n minus k term, the coefficient of this term is going to turn out to be n juice k. So this brings us to the general binomial theorem. It looks pretty scary. But in general, you shouldn't really try to memorize it. You should really just understand what it means, right? Don't don't memorize this. Don't memorize this. Just understand what it means. So x plus y, it says x plus y to the power of n equals the sum from where k varies from 0 to n, n factorial over n minus k factorial times k factorial times, oops, x to the power of n minus k times y to the power of k. So this actually implies directly our, our sum from earlier, right? The sum of n choose k where k varies from 0 to n that equals 2 to the power of n. So this actually follows from the fact that we this follows from the fact that when we expand 1 plus 1 to the power of n, right, using the binomial theorem, this term comes out to be exactly 1. So, so we have basically, so basic the binomial theorem, you can sort of think about it as a generalization of this earlier fact that we proved. But then now we're, we're extending it to expansions of binomials here. So once, so you can, see, so I should, I guess I should give a few examples. So x choose two, x plus y to power three equals x to power three plus three x squared y plus three x y squared plus y cubed, right? Maybe we have, so this we have three choose zero, then we have three choose one, then we have three choose two, and then we have three choose three, and so on. Sorry. Um, so maybe another example, x plus y to the power of six. This becomes this over here plus And we can see that the com combination numbers are showing up here as well. Okay. All right. So now, I guess so. Now that we have the binomial theorem, which is shows up decently often, um, I guess we can try to try our hand on at some problems. So the, our first problem is from 1969, SME problem 16. Problem goes like as follows. So when a minus b to the power of n, where n is greater than or equal to two, and a b is not equal to zero, is expanded. Um, when a equals k b for positive integer k, the sum of the second and third terms is zero. So now you want to find n in terms of k. So we're writing it as a minus b to the power of n, since a equals kb for some positive integer k, this becomes k times b minus b to the power of n. So expanding this, the second, so just expanding this, we use the binomial theorem to expand this, right? So the second term using the binomial theorem, it comes out to be uh, hmm. become the second and the third terms comes out to be k to the power of n minus one times negative k to the power of n minus one times b times n plus one, n choose one, plus this over here, 
and choose two. All right. Wait, sorry. And the power the exponent of b is at n both times. Sorry. Um. Okay. So we have. So now we want to find um n in terms of k, right? So we basically have, let's factor out like terms. We have negative, so we can factor this out. So now what we we have left is k times n choose 1 plus no, minus n choose 2 equals 0 right so this actually means that kn minus uh minus n times n minus one over two is equal to zero so this means that kn equals n n minus one over two and uh, k equals n minus 1 over 2, n equals 2k plus 1. So, so we have that n equals 2k plus 1. So, so we're basically what we did was we used the binomial theorem to expand this, this term over here. Um, the second and the third terms we got were the second and the third terms in the sum, right? Um, so we, our first term turned out to be this, second term was this, they both sum to zero. Through some manipulation, we were able to find that our answer was 2k plus 1. So notice that the, the b to the power of n, right, in the end, since, since we, we could factor that out, that didn't really matter at much at all, since all we cared about was that the sum of the two terms was zero. So this was the only part of the term that we actually cared about. The, the rest was just uh, tacked on at the end. And we can just forget forget about that. So in general, right, if you're if you're trying to prove that the sum of two things is zero, you should try to factor out every all of the weird stuff out of it. And then hopefully you'll get something similar, something simpler to work with and then that you can focus on that being zero instead of the whole thing being zero and this is so you're basically factoring at the common common factors um okay next one this is from the this is from the 2016 amc 10a problem 20. it's not really having anything to do with binomial theorem but it uses a similar similar idea okay so what when a plus b plus c plus d plus one to the power of n is expanded and like terms are combined the resulting expression contains exactly 1001 terms find n so all of the terms right all of the terms by the distributive property they're of the form a to the power of x b to the power of y c to the power of z b to the power of 1, no, v, w, 1 to the power of t, where these variables are going to sum to n, right? Because each term in the product is it's going to contribute exactly one of these terms. Either a is going to contribute an a, it's going to contribute a b, it's going to contribute a c, a d, or a 1, right? So, our like term, when our like terms combined, our 1001 terms, right, they correspond with all possible combinations of this type. So we're trying to find, we're trying to basically trying to find the number of ordered triples of non-negative integers here summing to n right um wait oh wait the, the problem asked um 
a, b, c, d to all be raised to a positive power. Yeah, sorry. I, I forgot about that. So this actually is talking about um, non-negative integers summing to n minus 4 because x plus y plus z plus w is, they're all positive. So our problem ends up actually being um, by stars and bars, right? We can think of it as inserting four dividers among n minus four elements, our total answer ends up being n minus four plus four, choose four. So this comes out to be n choose four. Now we just want this to be equal to 1001 in the end. So 1001 is going, what is it going to be equal to? So it's not, it's not, so we want to factor 1001. So 1001 is not divisible by two, not by three, not by five. Is it divisible by seven? Um, four, one, three. Yes, it is divisible by seven. So seven times 143, if you're good enough, then you'll see that this is also a multiple of 11. So this comes out to be seven times 11 times 13. That is our prime factorization of this number. So from here, you have n choose four equals seven times 11 times 13. So if you guess correctly, this is just basically guessing check right now, by now, you would have guessed 14. Because 14, right, it has seven. It has seven in its prime factorization and uh, 11 and 13, they're both four within it, right? So 14 to choose four equals 1001. You can verify this on your own. So our final answer is n equals 14. So this is a similar idea of about, the, similar to the binomial theorem, where you're basically treating expansions of these terms as ways to combine so you can think of it as each term in the product, right? Each term in the repeated product contributing one of its terms to whatever term is ends up being when the final product is expanding. So each term in final expansion, we, we treat it as a combination of A's, B's, C's, D's, and 1's. And this is due to the distributive property. So this relationship between like expansions of, of these, these algebraic, algebraic um, expressions, right? These expansions, the relationship with the, these combination numbers is something that I see decently often on tests, right? So to ask you, what is the coefficient of this? What is the coefficient of that? How many terms are there? How many terms are there with this particular property? And most of the time, they're just counting problems that are rephrased to, with the, to give them this sort of algebra flavor text, if that, if that makes any sense. All right, next problem. Um, all right, so we have this sum. So we have, we're summing negative one to the power of k times 99 to choose 2k. And we're, we want to simplify this sum as k varies from zero to 49. So 99 choose whatever, it's, it, it reminds us of the, the expansion of x plus y, right? x plus y to the power of, in this case, 99. The problem is, what do we substitute in for x and y, right? What do we substitute in for x plus and y? So the first thing you should do, you should think about is, 
we should substitute um one of our variables should be one one of one of our variables should be one one like none right because we only have we only have one exponent here not two exponents if both of them so so this implies that there might be like a secret exponent over here but it's it's ignored because it's just one so using wishful thinking you can assume that we're substituting one in for one of the for one of the values the second thing is why is this negative one to the power of k why is it not to the power of 2k because theoretically right these two terms should actually match so but what if what if we can write negative one to the power of k as something to the power of 2k so something to the power of 2 equals negative 1 so what is this number it turns out that what helps in this problem is substituting a complex number into the vinyl nil theorem and this complex number turns out to be i so we're going to consider i plus 1 to the power of 99 okay so i to 1 plus 1 to the power of 99 this becomes this the ex expansion of this turns out to be um uh, 99 all the way up to 99 i to the power of k times 99 times k so when k is even right when k is even we're we're looking for this right when k is is even then we get this sum we contribute a term to this sum when k k is odd we don't contribute anything to this sum and it turns out to be imaginary the contributes to the imaginary part okay so it turns out that we want the the real real part of this this complex number expansion right we want a real part of this so i'll leave it on your own to verify you can use this you, you can do this using the complex plane right one plus i and then you're and you're just and you're just multiplying you're just doing some complex complex um, multiplication um, complex number multiplication but the real number the real number part of this turns out to actually be um, negative two to the power of forty nine. So the real num the real part of this number is negative two to the power of forty nine, and this begin and this actually comes about from treating this as complex complex number multiplication, or you can try to add it. With its conjugate, right? You can try to find i plus one to the power of ninety nine plus the conjugate of it, which is one minus i to the power of ninety nine, and divided by two. That would also give you this answer, perhaps with a little bit more work. But anyways, so this is so in this problem, right? We we basically had to sort of reverse engineer our binomial expansion. So we started with the sum, and then we had to get the binomial expansion that would yield that sum. Usually it's the other way around. We have the binomial expansion, and then we want to find the sum. In this case, we had the sum, we wanted to find the binomial expansion from that. So this, this idea of bringing complex numbers in is example of the, it's an example of the roots of unity filter which is a pretty advanced topic, but if you're interested in it, in, in the, these types of problems, then I suggest you try out, you should read a few handouts on the roots of unity filter.
and you can see what that's all about. Okay. So last last problem of the day, which is this problem that seemingly looks like number theory, right? What's the hundredth digit of this huge number? Two thousand eleven to power of two thousand eleven. So what's the hundredth digit of this number? So first of all, how does what we've learned today have anything to do with this? And the interesting thing is, first of all, first of all, we're trying to find two to 2011, two power of 2011 mod 1000. This becomes 11 to power of 2011 mod 1000, right? Because 2000 is zero mod 1000. So we're trying to find this number mod 1000. Now, now we just need to try to find a neat way to write this and then we can find the hundredth digit of the number, right? So how do we find this? Well, the trick is that we can actually use the binomial theorem from earlier. We write 11 equals one plus 10. This is a pretty well-known trick. You write 11 as one plus 10, and now you can treat it as a binomial expansion that looks like this, right? So once you expand this binomial expansion, what do you get? So you get one, right, plus 2011 choose one times 10, plus 2,011 times two times 100, plus 2,011 times three times 1,000. Wait, hold on. 1,000 is zero mod 1,000, right? And in general, any term from beyond this point, any term beyond this, it turns out that this, any term beyond this is zero mod 1,000 because it has a large, large power of 10 dividing it, right? It has a large power of 10 greater than 1,000 that is dividing that number. So anything past this point, we can ignore. All, so basically it's using the binomial formula, we've reduced this number three question to just about just simplifying this, this, this decently easy problem. So we have one plus 20, 2011 tack on a zero, we can get rid of the 20 plus um, 2011 times 2010, choose two times 1,100. We keep simplifying this 100, right? Because we can deal with the 2000s as such. This becomes this becomes 55, such like this, equals, so our final answer turns out to be, our final remainder mod 1000 turns out to be 611, or that is our final answer. So we have our fi final hundredth digit is six. So, you, Again, we used the binomial theorem. We ex we wrote this 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 exponent thing as an expansion of the binomial theorem, which actually shows up more often than you might think in number theory problems. And then we because we were evaluating this mod one thousand, we were able to get rid of all the terms past a certain point and deal with the terms that were left. And these terms ended up being a little bit more easy to deal with than the, than the whole darn thing. So, so that's an um, example of how our, our combinatorial tools actually help us with um, a, a number theory problem. So the conclusion, so what, what did, we do today.
So today we explore properties of the Pascal's triangle. The most important property of the Pascal's triangle is its relation to the combination numbers, right? The combination numbers, which were numbers of like n choose k for some n and k. We also discussed binomial theorem, the binomial theorem, which comes from the expansion of binomial space to a certain power. And, and these were related to Pascal's triangle. And actually, sometimes we call our combination numbers, right, n choose k, sometimes we actually call these binomial coefficients, because they're so synonymous with the binomial theorem as well. So we discussed the binomial theorem, and then we did a, did a few questions. So for next week, for next week, um, read, read handout. I'm not sure what the current status of Bullard's handout is. Um, I'm not sure if it's done, whether he's still writing it, whether it will be published anytime soon. But when it is published, I encourage you all to read it just in case you need needed a second person to explain things to you. There are, there are a ton of videos on YouTube about Pascal's triangle, many of which might explain this better than I did today. There are a ton of videos. It's a really fascinating topic. Pascal's triangle is a very interesting topic in combinatorics. It's one of the it's one of the first things in combinatorics I learned that really sort of blew my mind, I guess. It was very, it, it, it is a pretty fascinating topic and uh, just keep practicing using, using the questions. There are a ton of questions on this topic as well. It's a very, it's a very rich subject. So I think that's about it. Um,